Well, good morning and good afternoon for some of you. My name is Jennifer Joyce, and I am the Regional Vice President of Sales for the Western Territory here at Conducive Technologies. And we are talking here with you today about how you can achieve two times faster SQL experience. Now, this webinar is going to be broken out into two parts, so just a couple housekeeping items here real quick. Uh, the first part we really consider to be the thought leadership portion. That is where we're just going to dig in under the hood just a little bit, get into the technology stack, and explain some of the I.O. inefficiencies that are occurring, just some of the degradation issues that take place, especially if you're running SQL Server, particularly if you have virtualized that workload. Now, uh, what's happening under the hood that's stealing all those underlying IOPS and really kind of ultimately causing some, you know, issues with the, the underlying storage, storage subsystem to work a lot harder than it really needs to. And we're going to be talking about why you might be getting less performance, maybe scratching your head because you got plenty of hardware sitting there and it's just still not quite like it should be. Uh, so we're going to be talking about that and some of the inherent IO penalties that are occurring. And uh, we're going to highlight a couple of those uh, once we give that overview. Now, uh, for the second part of the webinar, we're actually going to dive very quickly, high level, no more than 10 minutes, into exactly what our software does. Uh, now, Velocity is what we're talking about today. It is a set and forget software utility that runs in the background on Windows servers, and it's tackling those IO inefficiencies that we're talking about. Now, obviously, you know, I, I think I've kind of already alluded to this, but I think the biggest compelling question here is, what other way can we get more performance out of your SQL workloads that you already have besides throwing more hardware at it? Um, that can get real expensive real fast. So we have an extremely unique solution, can actually solve that problem with a 100% software approach. And after the webinar, we will be giving each of you a complimentary not for resale NFR copy. Uh, more than a $500 MSRP value because ultimately the proof is in the pudding. We want you to try it. Now, on the line with me today, uh, I've got my cohort, cohort uh, Howard Butler. Uh, Howard is the Senior Director of Systems Engineering. Now, Howard, uh, for any of you guys out there um, who are car fans, if you're ever on a one-on-one -on -one call with Howard and uh, you get a chance, kind of pick his brain on this, because not only does he specialize in accelerating performance in computers, he's also a race car instructor. So uh, he specializes in making cars go as fast as he possibly can whenever he gets the chance. So, Howard? Well, thanks very much, Jennifer. And by the way, guys, don't let Jennifer's title fool you. She's quite technical as well, as you see as we get moving along here. Now, one of the things I did want to mention, Jennifer, is that we would like to make this session rather interactive. And so there is a questions uh, box over there um, next to the chat room and stuff. And as we go through the session, guys, if you do have questions, please write them up, submit them, and we'll either get to them during the session or at the very end. So Jennifer, thanks again for, for having me here today. Okay, great. Thanks, Howard. Really appreciate you being here as well. So, uh, Dylan, let's go ahead and go to the first slide here and we jump right in. Now, uh, some of you may not have heard of Conducive Technology, so let me just tell you a little bit about us here. Uh, we are a 38-year-old software company. That's right, 38-year-old software company. And uh, we, from what we can tell in our research, we are the 12th oldest software company still in existence in the world. Um, now, we originally started as a company known as DiskKeeper. And many of you have probably even used our defragmentation software on your hard drives at some time in the past. Uh, then about, gosh, maybe six, seven years ago now, we brought out some really revolutionary intellectual property into the marketplace uh, that really replaced that defragmentation strategy. And it became all about reducing the noisy and unnecessary I.O. Now, as it turns out, on any given SQL server, that comes out to anywhere between 30 to 40% of all IO traffic is actually unnecessary. I'm just gonna repeat that because it's astounding. 30 to 40% of all IO traffic is absolutely unnecessary and can be eliminated. And that excess is just crushing things. It's stealing IOPS, it's stealing throughput. Now, when we get into this, um, what we're gonna be seeing with our Velocity software is that we are able to effectively offload that excess IO, get rid of it, and just not have it hitting storage at all. And this is where those accelerated gains in SQL are coming through. Now, you'll see here a couple of uh, kind of, I guess, what you could call our street cred uh, icons here. 
Um, you know, Gartner named us Cool Vendor of the Year when we came out with this innovative technology. Um, right now, we've got over 2,500 mid-market and large enterprise customers that are using our software. There are versions and iterations of pieces of our software, OEMs, uh, by the likes of Samsung, HP, uh, Western Digital. So, you know, if you haven't heard of us, you clearly have heard of them. And additionally, we work with, uh, you know, Microsoft is a gold partner. Uh, we are a VMware tab partner, and we are also a Citrix Ready partner um, up on all of their websites. So, uh, you know, the one that I didn't really touch on, Howard, maybe I could ask you to speak to, because I know this is a really big one, and I know you are closely involved uh, with this uh, initiative, but this is where Microsoft named us as a first ever, and to the best of my knowledge, still the only software vendor certified in their SQL IO reliability program. You know, you're right, Jennifer, and I do consider this a really elite certification. Microsoft does have certain levels uh, to make sure that other applications uh, like ourselves are fully compatible with their software. In this particular case, we're talking about SQL Server. And as you said, we're the only software vendor in the mix there. But we're in pretty good company with the folks like EMC and HP and so forth. And besides all the testing, we also had to go through a panel of SQL experts for a very rigorous Q&A session with them. So again, I think this is a really nice and, and high level certification, Jennifer, uh, that goes above and beyond uh, what other manufacturers would have done. And that's awesome. Now, Don, let's go to the next slide. I want to I want to get into a little bit more of this kind of thought leadership portion and talk about a survey that we had done and just really explain what's happening and creating all this noise and unnecessary IO traffic. Um, you know, the survey that we conducted, uh, we think it's the largest independent study done on IO performance. We had over a thousand IT professionals respond every year. Um, we asked one one very pointed question, um, and it was which hard hitting apps running on SQL, of the, of the apps that you have running on SQL, how many of you have performance problems so bad that you're actually getting staff or customer complaints due to the sluggish performance of some sort? Uh, it could be you know, slow queries, it could be slow performance, it could be batch jobs taking too long, it could be timeouts, it could be anything like that. Um, now, when you look at the graph, you'll see that 28% of all organizations raised their hand and said, yes, that's us. Last year, it was 27%. Uh, I think a few years ago, it was 26%. So it just is not getting any better. Um, so right in that sweet spot, you know, the likelihood is that if you're on this webinar, it's because you're in that you know, one out of four organizations that's having this or similar type of issue with, with performance in these applications. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. And let's just kind of look at the dominance of this on the next slide. Uh, we also ask the question, okay, and this is why we focus in on SQL, because our software runs in Windows. Our software optimizes any application running in the Windows context. But the reason we're focusing on SQL is because we asked, of all your IO intensive applications that you support, which one is the most challenging? Which one are you struggling with the most on performance? And the word cloud shows it. It's going to be databases, but SQL keeps rising to the top. Uh, not necessarily the, the, the contest they want to be winning, but this is where the problem is. So, and that's a lot of the, the reason because a lot of this is not necessarily SQL only. A lot of it is going to be how Windows handles it. So we're going to be talking about that as well. Just wanted to let you know that for us, seven out of 10, for every, every 10 new customers we acquire, seven of them came to us originally because of SQL. Then they, when they realize what it does for SQL, they look at other things. Now, here's an example on the next slide. Um, as another, another use case beyond SQL, uh, we did some testing recently within a Citrix context. context. And, uh, you know, so like I said, it's really anything running in Windows. An example here, we ran some iometer benchmarks on a Windows 10 system running Citrix Zen Desktop. And you can see here that transaction rates increased by 90% with velocity. And workload, and it's mentioned on the right-hand column here, that workload done in the same time period, the amount of work done, went up by 60% with velocity on. So this is just what our software does in the context of Windows. Now, I just got an echo on the line. Um, Howard, can you hear me echoing, or is it OK? As far as your audio goes, it's good. 
Okay, great. So it's just probably an echo feedback to me. So I'll just keep going. So let's jump on to the next slide, Dawn. Okay, great. Now, I think the setup was kind of long enough, so let's jump in. Before we give you a picture of what the IO degradation looks like, I kind of want to talk about and start with what it should look like, what an actual healthy IO profile should look like, what the optimal performance profile looks like. Now, obviously, this is a very rudimentary extraction of an IO profile, but I think the takeaway is pretty obvious and immediate. You can see that you get nice, large, clean, contiguous writes and reads. You can see that you're getting a healthy payload of data with every IO operation, and notice how nice and sequential the traffic looks. Now, this is an optimal environment to get optimal IO performance from your underlying flash, whether it's hybrid or you know, hyperconverged, disk storage. This also applies if you're running workloads in AWS, up in the cloud, or on physical servers. Okay, now, the problem, though, is that when you virtualize, it gets a little tougher, right? So obviously you're running SQLs, SQL in that Windows context. Now, so thanks for advancing the slide, Don. So on this next slide, what you wanna take a quick look at here compared to what we saw before is that, again, another immediate takeaway here, suddenly now this environment has an IO characteristic that's much smaller, it's fractured, it's random, it's what we call kind of like a, a death by a thousand cuts scenario. And this is what's causing the underlying architecture to have to work much, much harder than it needs to be. This is what's penalizing storage performance. It's what we call the perfect trisecta of bad storage performance, small, fractured, random IO characteristics. And just as a note, this happens no matter how many IOPS you've got. We did, uh, um, an evaluation with someone who had a pure storage, 600,000 IOPS, and they only had 11 physical servers attached to it and they were still missing their SLAs. They installed their software and they started making their SLAs and we were the only change they made. They were only using 3% of that IOPS capacity within that, that SAN. They couldn't figure out why it wasn't happening. Uh, so this, we're gonna get into exactly why here as we dig into the hood and really kind of talk about these two IO penalties that are really contributing to that. And it has nothing, by the way, it has nothing to do with your hardware. It has everything to do up at the top of the stack with the Windows operating system and how IO is being treated. Now, the first one that I'm gonna talk about is called the IO blender effect. Now, uh, Dawn, we could even go to the next slide on this one. <clears throat> Great, thank you. Okay, so the reason that we, we wanted to bring this slide up is to really kind of talk about the IO blender effect. We're talking about that second level down from the hypervisor, okay? Now the IO blender effect is what happens the moment you virtualize and you've got multiple servers on the host, the hypervisor, or on the storage, um, like the example of the guy with the 600,000 IOPS rating on his peer. He didn't even have a hypervisor. That was just 11 physical servers attached and he was still having the IO blender effect, right? You can just remove that layer, it's still there. It's bad enough that way. But the thing that I'm thinking here is, you know, it's like virtualization has been fantastic for server efficiency. What would we do without it? You know, one of the biggest downsides is that it adds complexity to the data path. Now, when you add the second VM, the third VM, the fourth VM, guess what you're doing? You're amplifying the effects of that randomization of IO even further. Now, one of the reasons I like this slide is because it really kind of shows hey, if you had optimal I.O. coming from the source, from one VM, it's still going to get buffered around by that I.O. blender effect of the data from all the other VMs. It's really, really horrible. So you're trying to fix one application, but the I.O. from all the other applications that are not your tier one apps that you don't really care about as much are getting in the way. It's simply unavoidable. When you really think about it, virtualization is a necessity in your environment. You absolutely have to have it for cost efficiency running. It's just the way the world is today. Velocity is a necessity to make virtualization run properly and run even faster and just get rid of this drag. Now, most organizations do not realize the full impact and penalty that comes with virtualization and that added complexity to the data path because they have a tendency to virtualize slowly over time. And some of our biggest and best customers are those that kind of flip the switch and went 100% physical to virtual overnight. And Howard, there's a really, really good example of this with Christus Health. Uh, they're one of the top 10 largest healthcare providers in the US. They're located out of Texas. 
and they virtualized uh, kind of overnight. Uh, 2,000 servers, you know, went live. And Howard, I, you were part of that evolution, and I know you've got some really good insights into that. We share those with us. Yeah, well, they did their testing, you know, like anybody would do on individual systems. And, you know, what they expect is that they that when they went from physical to virtual platforms, they get the same kind of, of performance uh, that they had previously tested with. But when they actually virtualized all those systems, they didn't. What they got was a performance degradation or loss. And during their analysis, what they found is that it wasn't CPU, it wasn't memory, it was IO bottlenecks, Jennifer. And that's what caused their issues there. Now, their first reaction was, gee, we're gonna have to upgrade all of our storage, we're gonna have to go to an all flash type of, of storage array uh, to solve that type of, of IO bottleneck issue. Uh, but before they did that, they got a copy of our software and we worked with them to, to solve that IO bottleneck issue. And so for them, they were able to see the, the benefits of what our software could do. And so for them, rather than spending $2 million for an all flash hardware upgrade, um, they just simply invested in our software for a fraction of that cost and we saved them from having to spend all that extra money. So it was a really good use case, a real world uh, type of example of, of what people see with, with our software. Thank you, Howard. Really appreciate you covering that for us. Now, I am getting uh, some feedback again. I'm wondering, Howard, if maybe um, you're maybe needing to go on mute when I'm speaking. I'm not sure. So, okay, that uh, that handled it. Thank you. Um, so, now, uh, and on the, the Christus, you know, we've got uh, 20 plus case studies on our website. That's one of the published case studies. We actually just republished that case study with them because they're now up to over 2,500 VMs across the enterprise. Um, so with that being said, you know, remember I mentioned that there are two IO penalties. We've really been talking about the IO blender effect penalty right now. And what I wanna talk about is actually the Windows IO tax. Uh, as bad as the IO blender effect penalty is, the Windows IO tax I think is even worse because it's directly affecting individual performance on servers and it's contributing to this huge IO blender effect problem that comes down below. Um, there's some really severe inefficiencies in the handoff of data between Windows and the underlying storage. And remember, there are no APIs that connect the two. They cannot talk to each other. So Howard, you know, this, this really creates a serious problem because the Windows operating system is designed to write and read kind of with one IO or two IOs, minimal number of operations. Windows ultimately takes that uh, you know, file, just any given file, and breaks it down into smaller pieces. And ultimately, you end up with a process that creates multiple IO, mo excuse me, multiple IOs just for a single file that really should be just written and read with one IO or something. So Howard, can you um, just highlight for us a little bit what's happening here, why Windows is so inefficient in the handoff of data? Well, you know, the, the Windows file system truly does take kind of a one size fits all approach, Jennifer. So when a file gets created or extended, the Windows file system really doesn't know how big that file is going to be. So what it does is that on the logical side, you know, within the Windows operating system, within the NTFS file system, it looks for the next fixed allocation. And if that file extension that the application is queued up wanting to write is bigger than that, it'll fill up what it can and then go on and grab the next available segment of free space, write what it can and so on and so forth. So each one of those allocations is an extra IO request, okay? So now you're getting all these tiny, small, random IOs being sent out to the storage rather than a nice, larger, sequential IO. And so we'll talk a little bit later on on how we solve this, but as you can see, now you're getting with all these, these small IOs coming from the system itself, whenever you look at some benchmarks of storage, they typically give you two numbers, uh, Jennifer. And you know, you'll find that those measurements on random IOs versus sequential IOs, you're always going to notice that the sequential IOs generally outperform the random ones. So if we can help force Windows to do nice, large 
sequential IOs, you're always going to get the best performance out of your storage under those conditions. Thanks a lot, Howard. Now, if we go to the next slide, and um, thank you. And Howard, maybe I can ask you to mute on your side again. Um, so now, you know, this what Howard is talking about really kind of takes us to this next slide. We've got what I like to call the top of the stack slide, because one, that's its name, and two, it makes a really good point. So we really want to catch this stuff at the top of the stack, at the source of the I.O. Uh, one of the case studies on our website you may want to check out was published by the University of Illinois. Um, and it's a good example of what we're talking about here because their hardest hitting databases uh, were actually some Oracle databases and some SQL databases. Uh, they were already running those databases on the latest Dell servers. They had installed the latest Dell Compel and all flash arrays in their environment and the hardest hitting workloads they have, everything was running fine, but after about a year, performance degraded and they thought they'd have to buy more all flash arrays to get more IOPS to meet their end user SLAs. Uh, but before they did that, they heard about what our software did, and they tried it. The evaluation is free, nothing to lose, so they installed it and more than doubled their performance. Um, and they couldn't believe it. In fact, uh, we were just at VMworld uh, at the end of August and got to sit down with uh, the University of Illinois and the users who were actually in charge of all of that. And we actually couldn't get a word in edgewise because Howard, he, he – uh, regaled us about our software for almost an hour. So it was it was incredible. I was like, really? Can, can we film this? You know, this is great stuff. And he said, no, it's exactly what happened. So it was really neat for me. It was the first time I got to, because I work the West, it's the first time I ever got to talk with that customer. And it was really neat to hear that case study come to life uh, over a live conversation. It was it was pretty cool. Um, I hear it all the time, but it's just, it's wonderful when, when we get to see it in person like that. Um, so you know, what, what happens is that we really take an approach where we go, you know, at, from the top of the stack. And, and as I mentioned, Howard and I would cover maybe kind of a 10 minute overview of how we do this, but this is where we start. Um, as soon as we're done covering how we do this, we'll get the NFR handed off to you. Uh, we'll cover best practices on using the NFR so you can start experiencing the benefits of velocity for yourself in your own environment. So, uh, you know, velocity, we, we actually have the copyright on the phrase, set it and forget it. Um, uh, and you know, a lot of people don't know that, but I guess everyone on the webinar now knows that. And the reason we have that is because the software installs right into the Windows operating system and that's it. You don't have to do anything else. You can literally walk away and it'll just do its thing. It's a very thin filter driver. Uh, it's what has what we call near zero overhead impact. We would challenge you to even see the CPU footprint. It's enormously lightweight. Uh, the CPU resources that it does use, uh, they run at lowest priority, so it's never interfering with your server performance. And, you know, what the software is actually offloading is I.O. from the underlying storage. And then at the same time, as Howard mentioned, we're streaming the remaining I.O. traffic, uh, streamlining the remaining I.O. traffic. So it's really a friendly I.O. profile for your storage to process, and it's so much faster. Now, I did want to mention as well, we do have the Q&A box. We're going to be getting to the Q&A session here really, really shortly. Uh, so if you have questions, start dropping them in, especially as we start going through how we do the optimization, you're probably going to have some questions. Now, we have two patented engines um, that do this work. Now, the, the main things that we also want to touch on are compatibility. So Windows... Uh, Windows does not have, um, you know, a flavor for Pure, a flavor for Nimble, a flavor for HP. Windows is Windows is Windows. Everything else is compatible to Windows, and we are as well. So since we install right inside the Windows operating system, we're good to go, um, and we're compatible with everything else. We don't try to talk to everything else as well. We only only focus on Windows. Now, the first uh, engine is the write optimization engine, and the second patented engine is our read uh read optimization engine. So we're going to do, um, uh, just talk about the write optimization engine first, and then we'll talk about the read optimization. So Howard, let's start first on what we're doing to optimize writes. Now, uh, we already talked about how Windows has this issue, where it's only looking for the next available allocation of the logical disk layer, whether it's the right size or not. Um, you know, and you know, it's it's really inefficient the way that Windows handles this. You know, as time goes on and files are written, erased, rewritten, extended, that's where the degradation really starts coming in and the breakdown starts coming in. You know, if you're trying to write a 64K file and the next available space is only 4K, it's going to fill up the 4K, then look for the next available allocation, fill it, rinse and repeat 
until the entire file is fully written. Now, um, that's just unnecessary excessive I.O. That's what I was talking about earlier when I was talking about 30, 40, 50% of all the I.O. that's there doesn't need to be there. So Howard, we have uh, the patented technology that can actually solve the problem. Uh, just make sure that we're delivering as much density, as much KB per I.O. as we can. Uh, so will you share with us just a little bit about, um, you know, kind of what, what we're doing there to make that happen? Sure, Jennifer. You know, kind of as I said before, the file system doesn't know how big that file creation or extension is going to be. So as you just articulated and said, uh, Windows is just looking for the next allocation. Well, we're doing something very simple to address this. In the background, we're monitoring your system and we're saying to ourselves, hey, this file type or this application, when it's getting creating uh, a file or extending a file, we know from our behavioral analytics that we're monitoring of how big that file is likely to be. So we just simply feed that intelligence back to the Windows file system. So now the Windows file system says, oh, here comes this file creation, and I'm going to look for the best allocation to put this. So it winds up with a nice sequential write. Okay. So Windows is still doing all the heavy lifting. Windows is still fully in, in charge of writing the data. Uh, we're just giving it uh, more information to make a more intelligent uh, decision about what range of logical clusters to allocate. So if you thought about this, just providing that type of information so the Windows file system can do a better job, I like to use this analogy. Think about this, guys. If you wanted to carry a gallon of water from one place to another, would you do it with a hundred small individual little Dixie cups or would you do it with one big container so you can move all the data in one motion? That's what we're helping the file system enforce. Nice sequential writes, which is far more efficient and more optimum to, to process, Jennifer. Thank you very much, Howard. And, you know, as I mentioned kind of at the beginning of the webinar as well, um, that we had replaced our defragmentation engines. This is what we replaced it with, guys. So you don't have to let files break and then fix them. They just don't break. Um, you know, kind of another analogy, Howard, that I like to think about is uh, kind of the egg on the wall falls and breaks and all the work it takes to clean that up and reassemble. Just don't let the egg fall. Just don't let the egg break. And that's really what we're doing. So we're, we're getting that nice streamlined IO efficiency removing 30 to 40 percent of the shards or the unnecessary I.O., if you will, and just letting things flow through in that sequential, really nice, easy to process I.O. profile. Now, you know, it's it's interesting because, you know, it, that net takeaway was, was pretty powerful, but there's a second engine that layers in now as a totally separate activity, and this one's called IntelliMemory. Now, this one is very, very different from the write engine. This is actually a DRAM read caching engine where we're establishing what we like to call a tier zero cache strategy in your environment. Now, this simply leverages the idle available DRAM sitting there on any given VM or physical server, or could be in the cloud, and we're just utilizing any of that memory that's sitting there idle and free, going unused, it's otherwise wasted, and we're gonna use a percentage of that, not all of it, but just a portion of that to serve hot reads. Now, the real genius of this engine is that it is completely dynamic. Remember that whole set it and forget it thing, right? You don't actually have to set it, you can just fire it and forget it. We should, we should copyright that though, and let's make a note. Um, so you don't have to carve out or allocate any memory from cache. The software is aware of how much memory is unused at any given moment on your system, and it will only use a portion of that to serve hot reads. So that way you're never having to have an issue of resource contention, you never have to worry about memory starvation because the intelligence of the engine is completely dynamic. We'll give memory back if it's needed, and we do it instantly. Now, I know sometimes when people start thinking about caching, read caching, uh, they get the idea that it needs to be really capacity intensive to take advantage of caching effectively, kind of like SQL, because SQL tries to cache the whole database if you let it. But Howard, you know, that, that simply isn't true. What we found is that 
you just four gigs of free space on a system. Uh, we can oftentimes serve 25, 30, even up to 50% of read traffic from storage. Most systems already have that sitting there free. So it's not about being capacity intensive. Our behavioral analytics engine is so powerful that we can leverage just slices, just a little bit of DRAM. And keep in mind as well that, you know, reading from memory is 12 to 15 times faster than going down to your flash or SSD layer. So just a little bit of capacity can have a huge impact on offloading a lot of that noisy I.O. and those hot reads that would otherwise have to go to, you know, all the way down the stack and back. Um, so again, I, I just want to remind people, start dropping those questions into the Q&A session. Uh, we'll be getting to those in just a second here. And um, Howard, is there anything that you want to add on to uh, kind of what I was talking about in telememory before we go into the handoff of the NFR and best practices for the evaluation? You know, Jennifer, just real quickly, there are probably two things that I, I again, want to point out there um, that's very unique about our telememory uh, read data caching. And that's one of the reasons why nine of the top uh, 10 PC OEM manufacturers license our technology. You know, of course, you might not have heard of, of our technology in their, their environment because they license under their names. But the two things that you indicate is dynamic memory usage. And that will only use memory that's free, available, idle, or otherwise unused by other processes or application. Um, as well as what data do we want to put into, into uh, our cache? And so, you know, if there's a, a demand for that memory, we'll give it back to those applications so there's no chance of any type of memory starvation. And then, you know, we're looking at, you know, what read data requests are repetitively occurring that we could potentially cache and by doing so would give you the best performance gains um, because we know that access to some data may be more relevant or more important than access to other data so it's very intelligent of what data to cache we don't need a lot of space as you had indicated and it's very dynamic great thank you howard so let's go to the next slide, Don. I want to kind of wrap it up. We're, we've just gone one or two minutes over to the bottom of the hour. We'll get into the Q&A here in just a second. Um, it, since we are at the bottom of the hour, if anyone does have to drop, we will send a recording of the webinar. You can catch the last bits, but uh, we're going to be getting there, so stick with us with, if you can. Um, so this is what the UI looks like, and you can see here it clearly represents for you the, you can see very clear terms, how much I.O. you're saving, what that translates into storage time saved. And if we go to the next slide, there's a a velocity management console that comes with the product. Uh, it's bundled in with no charge. And this allows you to centrally manage, deploy, and get analytics and reporting from the software as well. So it's very easy to manage. Uh, a little bit on the best practices side of deployments. Uh, no reboot is required um, to deploy the software, which is great. And uh, it's, it's a .msi, so you don't have to use our velocity management console. You can package it up, script it, whatever you want to do for deployments as well. Um, it also does not require a reboot to remove it. Uh, let's go on to the next slide, Dawn. So just wanted to just touch on, on this real quick, a couple of use cases that some of you may be able to relate to. We've already talked about Chris's health. Uh, we won't, won't touch on that. I'll just touch on one or two of these real quick. Uh, one good example right in the middle of the slide, ASL Marketing, they had a huge import batch job. Uh, it took 27 hours to complete. They installed us, uh, didn't have the budget to rip and replace, and we got it down to 12 hours. Um, and I, I was lucky enough to be part of that install. It was great to see that. Um, so let's go, in the essence of time, Dawn, let's go ahead and continue on to the final slide here. Um, so let's just take a real quick look uh, at this. Now, you know, I, I realize that step one says add more DRAM if possible. That's probably not going to be necessary. Like I said, uh, Howard and I have done deployments to tens of thousands of servers, and less than 1% of all of those servers have ever we needed to recommend to add memory to. In fact, we just did a uh, deployment assessment with Christus about four months ago on their 2,500 VMs, and there were, what, Howard, 50 that we said, yeah, add three gigs here, add six gigs here, add 12 gigs here, kind of a thing. So it was really, really minimal. Um, most servers already have plenty. So probably step one, you can skip. Step two, though, don't skip. Uh, cap SQL 
for sure, because SQL will take the memory. You want to try on a big, heavy SQL server, you want to try to leave a minimum of 8 gigs, 3, 16 is better. If it's not real heavy workloads, it's not pushing terabytes of data, you can get away with 4 to 8. Um, but uh, that's kind of a guideline. And it, nice, the nice thing is, is that after you install it, you can make adjustments later if there isn't enough free memory. Uh, so it will dynamically accept those adjustments. And then monitor the Velocity dashboard and hop on the phone. In fact, Dawn, we should probably add step four, hop on the phone with Conducive for a uh, free evaluation and assessment of how that performance is going in the environment. Um, so with that being said, uh, we wanna go ahead and let you know that we will be sending to everybody on the call uh, the their NFR copy. Now, what I wanna just kind of throw out there, there are two things that you can get access to in addition to your NFR copy. One of them is the Conducive I.O. Assessment Tool. Don't have a slide on it here, but the Conducive I.O. Assessment Tool is a free tool that we've created. Uh, it does not require installation on your target servers. It just uses remote WMI calls to go out and get existing performance monitor data from your target servers, and it will pull it all into a nice analysis to see, are these servers even good candidates for our software in the first place before you go to the work of doing a proof of concept? Uh, so if you would like the I.O. Assessment Tool, uh, definitely, we can have you um, type into the window IOAT, and we will make sure that you are sent a download link for the IO assessment tool after the webinar. I highly recommend it. It's a great way to start. The second thing that you can have is the Velocity Management Console trial, where you can extend it to all of the VMs. In fact, you can put it on every VM in your environment. I just kicked off a proof of concept yesterday. They're gonna, they've got their 30 days, they're gonna use their first uh, first two weeks to just do limited deployments, and then in their third week, they're gonna deploy to all 70 VMs in their environment, just so that they can see this IO blender effect getting eliminated. So we will give you full access to full copies of the software to use as broadly as you want, so you can really get the full benefits and see what it does for that 30-day trial. If you would like that, type into the window VMC, stands for Velocity Management Console. If you want both, the IO assessment tool and the Velocity Management Console, Type in both. Okay, so now let's go ahead and uh, see. I have not been monitoring the question box because we're so into into the talking. Um, Howard, before we jump into Q and A, is there anything else that you wanted to to throw out there or mention at all? No, I think we're good to go. Let's take tackle some of these uh, questions that are out there. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so um, bear with me as I kind of. Uh, learning how to navigate this question and answer box here. We have one question here. Uh, any known bad issues with running your undelete server with Velocity, especially with older Windows Server operating systems 32-bit? So that's the first question, Howard. So no, there are no known issues. I meant we're a software development company and we eat our own dog food, meaning that we run all of our products concurrently on all of our systems. Uh, in our production environment, and um, we're very confident um, of our products interacting just fine together. Uh, I did notice the question was talking about older versions of Windows. Velocity supports Windows 2008 R2 and above. Um, so those would be the systems that we would targeting be targeting with the Velocity software product. Okay, great. So there's kind of a, another question from, uh, uh, Barton as well. It's a little bit different, which is why I stopped. So he, he asks, now, if I run it on the host, but not on the VMs, how much IO speed increase? So Howard, our recommendation is not actually to install on the host, even if it's a Hyper-V host. So we can't install on a non-Windows operating system. So we don't even install on VMware or Citrix or anything like that. And on Hyper-V host, we have installed there, we can, but Howard, I, I, is that our best practice or would it just really be focused on the VMs? The best practice would be to put us on the Windows guest VMs. There's specific file system information that's only available at the guest VM, not at the host. So if you truly want best performance and follow our best, recommend, best practice recommendations, it is to put our software on all the guest VMs uh, running Windows. Nothing of our software needs to be on the host. Okay. Okay, so Barton has another question, um, which is, what about Oracle Virtual Box software? Any known issues or compatibility is what I'm thinking the question is. Yeah, nothing comes to mind there. I mean, I, I think kind of going back to uh, 
you know, one of our discussion points here is we're installed inside of Windows. We're part, you know, of, of the behavior of Windows. Um, and if your environment is already compatible with Windows, then our software is going to be compatible with your software and your hardware by virtue of the fact that we're only interested in helping Windows do a better job, not specifically targeting um, the interaction of other applications. Okay, great. Now, Howard, here's a question uh, from Jared that we'll just take head on here. He says, uh, do you offer proof of concept? I tried Velocity about five years ago. Notice some performance degradations disabled that seemed to go away. Uh, not sure what the issue was. So, Howard, for that one, yes, we do offer evaluations. Uh, any thoughts on that particular question? Um, well, yeah, we certainly do offer um, a proof of concept. Be happy to work with you, uh, Jared, on that. Um, I really can't speak intelligently over what happened five years ago. Shoot, I can't even remember what I had for breakfast yesterday. <laughs> uh, but uh, the reality is, you know, software has evolved. Um, we're a very dedicated software uh, development company in terms of um, of our product lines. Um, we take um, any feedback from customers and always strive to do a better job. And uh, I believe we have a, a very solid product uh, at this point, we'd be happy to work with you to uh, make sure that uh, it fits well in your organization. Yeah, and and Howard, I'll just add on to that as well. That you know, we're we're throwing the software over the fence at you guys. You guys can <laughs> you know what you're doing. You're smart guys. You can you can figure out the installs. You can run with this. But we are here to support the proof of concepts. We will hop on as many calls as you want. We'll go over the results. We'll go over the analytics. Dive deeply into it as much as you need to build your business case for the software. Um, maybe if uh, it needs any tuning or we need to uh, deploy more broadly. We are here to help you hands-on. So get in touch with us for those processes. Um, Richard, uh, I believe, oh no, I can't tell who the line is from. It might be Richard, it might be Barton. I apologize, it's not clear on the screen here, but it says, please mention SQL, especially recent versions can unload out of memory if it thinks SQL is not busy in use, even if it has some use. A real world problem that I have seen uh, setting a minimum memory in SQL to 512 megabytes of RAM. So, Howard, I'll send that to you. Well, you know, there has to be some, um, you know, intelligence placed here as to, you know, what amount of memory do you allow SQL to use, uh, making sure that SQL just doesn't run away with all the memory on a system, because if it does, then there's, you know, little to no memory available for us to use. Um, in regards to if SQL needs that memory, it can expand and grab the memory. Velocity will back off, give that memory back to Windows uh, to always ensure that there is an adequate supply of free, available, unused memory, uh, and we'll dynamically adjust the size of our cache uh, to ensure that Windows always has a healthy amount of memory available for whatever reason, whether it's needed for SQL, other applications, or, or the Windows operating system. Okay, great. Uh, now we have uh, three more questions in the box. As soon as the last question is answered, we'll be ending the webinar. So if you're holding on to a question you haven't asked yet, go ahead and type that in, we'll get to it. Um, so we've got a question from Jeff. It says, how does the software platform work with Azure's IAAS VMs since we have no control over the IO or the underlying storage? Well, if you have access to be able to install our software into the base image, that's being used for um, the, the cloud provider there, um, you'll get the benefit from Velocity. Um, but we have to be able to install inside the guest VM. Okay, fantastic. Now it looks like, uh, I'm on the last question, it looks like it says, what is the impact of installing it? Most of the VMs are tight with memory and resources. Well, the impact of installing it is Within a few moments, we expect that you'll start seeing reduction of IO traffic going to storage, and you'll see a positive benefit being provided. Um, you know, you do need to install the software. It takes a minute or so to, to run through an interactive manual install. We do have a centralized management console that you can spin up and manage the software. When I say manage, that means deployment. Um, report generation, uh, product control, license tracking, and so forth. 
the whole kit and caboodle can be managed uh, directly from a single pane of glass through our management console. And that's what most of our customers would use. Um, and it makes it real easy to do silent type of installs. Um, and the most important thing, and, and this I want to really stress, we've worked out a, meth a method that we can install our software and do not need a reboot to have our software functioning. So no reboots required, uh, just point and shoot, set it and forget it, you're good to go. Awesome. So Howard, that's the last of the questions. Uh, we got a couple of guys that we answered their questions saying, thanks, excellent, you're, you guys are welcome, more than welcome. Uh, we really look forward to working with each and every one of you, hands-on, one-on-one, uh, definitely, you know, set up times to talk with myself and Howard or our other counterparts in the organization who may be coverage, covering your, your accounts and your territory. Uh, but we are here to help. It's a really, really incredible software solution and a very, very cost-effective way to address SQL performance issues. Or if there's any, probably some of you have some ideas of some other applications outside of SQL that could use some help as well. So thank you again, everyone, for participating today. And we really had a great time. Okay, that's it. All right, guys. Thank you.